you are listening to the Big Blue Podcast. Uh, I'm Greg Stone, Metro Campus Provost, with our distinguished president, Dr. Lee Goodson. Hello. How are you? Hello. How are you, Dr. Stone? I Good to see you. I am great. You too. And we are here today with Dr. Jan Clayton, who is Senior Student Affairs Officer for the college. Jan, thanks for coming in. Happy to be here. Appreciate it. Of course, this is a slow week with nothing going on, <laughs> so we can all just sit around and talk for a minute. I know. I was wondering how you put it on our calendar today, but right. we're glad to be here. And uh, anyway, and glad that you're here. Absolutely. And we're here the week before the fall semester begins <clears throat> just to talk with Dr. Clayton about what's going on in Student Affairs. A lot of really significant and important um, changes and events and programs that have gone on the last year. And so, um, Jan, if you maybe just wouldn't mind, kind of remind us about where we've been with Student Affairs Reorganization. Sure. Um, and, and what has that meant to the institution as a whole in terms of employees? And, and how do you think we're doing now two years in? Because you all reorged before we did the Academic Affairs Reorg, so you're, you're a bit ahead of us. That's right. In, in a lot of ways, um, that time has passed quickly. Um, it was uh, November of 2015 that we uh, announced our reorg. In fact, I believe that we came back from Thanksgiving break mm -hmm. and we went uh, straight to work uh, with the reorganization of student affairs. And in a lot of ways, that probably sounds like a lot of time in terms of boots on the ground doing the work, though that two years has flown by um, pretty quickly. Absolutely. So what, what do you think um, has been the impact of student affairs since the reorganization, maybe some of the major achievements? And I know that there's been a lot going on, Jan, with um, just everybody adjusting and kind of having to do their job differently. Talk to us about what you think our major achievements been. Absolutely, and I'm you know I'm kind of nervous, and so I think that I didn't answer a portion of Greg's question. That's so right. I'll you want to redo? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get, he he kind of gave me meaningful eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to answer his question and yours as one um, to just kind of say overall at a macro level, the biggest thing that the reorganization did for us is it centralized responsibility for our service areas, and that was critical because the work that we need to do in our strategic plan to execute strategies that support student success and the work that we need to do as a part of Pathways would be so much more difficult with the old decentralized structure mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. as I like to say, four, four of everything. Sometimes it's yeah. good to have four of everything. I'd like four chips, but sometimes <laughs> it's better to just have one yeah. um, really good thing. Uh, there are so many things. I actually asked my team. I told my team I was getting to do the radio show and to send me some of, uh, you know, what they thought their big accomplishments were. I got pages and pages. Yeah. And so I'm going to quickly, because I want them all to have their, their recognition, I'm going to just highlight at least one thing from each of their areas really quickly that I think have been major achievements just this past year alone. Awesome. Um, so Student Life has um, started a new program, True Blue Lead, and I think Jenny Beatty will be in to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting because our students get an opportunity to act as college ambassadors and help us with onboarding other students. Um, we're really excited about the fact that for the first time ever at the college, we now have mental health services for our students. And I think our faculty and our staff have, have long um, uh, let us know that that is a need uh, for students. Uh, in our diversity and inclusion area, uh, among the things they've done, uh, they created student retention specialists. So we have a really small team right now uh, of individuals who make that one-on-one -on -one contact with some of our populations of students that need that additional support. Um, first generation students, our underrepresented students of color, um, our first time entering a college, a low-income student. Uh, one of the other areas uh, that has been a big lift, um, one area in particular um, has been a part of that lift, is academic advising and our mandatory advising and our mandatory new student orientation. Um, the latter of which uh, really is a college effort to ensure that all first-time entering students go through an orientation. And so um, it's mandatory now, and we had over 3,700 students participate last year, and we're on track to outpace that um, this year. 
Um, we've had our first ever uh, assessment uh, plan and uh, report for student affairs. And so that's a whole new department that didn't exist uh, before the um, reorg. And then uh, lastly, there are lots of things that have happened in our enrollment management area, um, one of which I think is a, a major uh, example of continuous improvement is retooling our college outreach program into a program known as Big Blue Blitz. I think we've talked about it um, here on the program mm -hmm. before and increasing <clears throat> the participation of high school students in that program. There's a lot. So, there, a lot. so, there, good stuff. so there's a whole lot. Um, but most of all, I'm, I'm most proud of all of the individuals involved in doing all of that work. Um, the willingness to, to pivot um, while maintaining quality service to students, but at the same time being open to reaching um, for more and better for our students, which isn't always easy, but um, we really have a great team of folks across the college who commit to that every day, and, and that makes me the most proud. Well, you mentioned pathways just a little bit ago. I mean, a, a lot of the pathways essential practices have to do with student affairs and operations as much as they do um, with teaching and learning and academic affairs. So I'm just curious, what, given all those improvements that have already been made, what are the big rocks that are left on your list? I mean, what are, what are the opportunities for some growth and continuous improvement that are coming up in the next couple of years as you see it? So one thing that we're in the um, middle of working on right now is how we improve the first year experience for students. And there's great work that's happening on the academic side of the house, the retooling, for example, of the college strategies course to support that. On our side of the house, we've got some opportunities too. Uh, one big thing we're working on are intake processes for students. Uh, we're redesigning those. It, it shouldn't take a um, hundred steps for a student to be able to express an interest in our college and then be um, able to enroll in a class and uh, we are going to commit to making those steps uh, shorter uh, more meaningful and when students come into our college we want students to come in informed and really with a plan uh, in terms of what they want to study and what they want to do so we have an opportunity to do more career education on the front end helping them make a really good decision about program and major and all of that we know will speed up completion. Um, next year will be our last year with Pathways and the big focus there will be our equity and inclusion work. And so we've already been doing some great work um, in that area and Eunice Tarver would be the individual who could speak to those specifics. But we wanna continue our work to diversify our staff. Um, more than 39% of our student enrollment are students of color. We wanna be reflective of that. Uh, a big thing we spent the summer talking about is financial planning and education for our students. Um, more than 40% of our students receive some form of Pell Grant. And what we know is that students need knowledge and information about how to plan for college, how to, how to pay for college, how to manage their resources through college. So we're looking for ways to start that conversation earlier with students and uh, improve on what we do. And we already, um, you know, just through studying our own steps, we learned some things uh, this summer that we're doing that we could do better. Um, I'll give you a quick example and give credit to the leadership of the Bursar area for this. That is that we've had payment plans for some time for students, but um, we did not open those payment plans up. Uh, we opened them up um, period by period. So what that means is, is a student would have to immediately sign up for a plan and immediately start a payment process. Well, by expanding the window and allowing students to sign up for a plan but start the payment process later in the semester, we've seen an increase. Um, we just had a great report out from our bursar. Mm -hmm. We've seen an increase in students who are self-paying um, with more options uh, to pay later. That's great. That's great. That's probably a whole lot of info, wasn't it? No, it's good. <clears throat> it's yeah. absolutely in the right direction, and I'm yeah. excited about you know what's coming up next. We've had um, Eunice Tarver on the podcast before, so it'll be good to get her back once yeah, we we'll really get into that year of focus. Yeah. Absolutely, next summer. Yep. Well, our guest today on the Big Blue Podcast is Dr. Jane Clayton, TCC's Senior Student Affairs 
Affairs Officer, and we're talking about the work of student affairs at TCC. So, Dr. Clayton, we're getting ready to start the fall semester, and uh, the question that um, I always get is, how's enrollment? <laughs> and so, um, we all just kind of stay frozen and hold our breath until we get past the first two weeks to know, you know, where we where we shook out on that number. And, and we also know that unemployment is at an all-time low, mm -hmm. which um, also means that it's harder to get the students in because they have the opportunity to have a job instead of go to school. So talk to us just about how we have more of a collective effort regarding the enrollment processes and getting students into class. And can you kind of tell us how that's been received across the college? Absolutely. Um, I, I love that you um, reference it as a collective effort and um, your leadership has always been that enrollment management really is the business of the college and we've had an opportunity to really work that way this summer um, in a collaborative fashion. We've been having weekly meetings um, with a team of leaders from across the college, all areas from academics to student affairs uh, to our to our business. Uh, and uh, our IT all in the same um, room and really um, looking at how we can be effective with the strategies that uh, we execute uh, that support enrollment and um, where are there opportunities to identify new ways of doing business. And I think we've done great work. Um, and as I say, we, the we is a true collective because as we've identified opportunities, then we've reached out to the rest of our college community and we've sought their help for things like call campaigns. And everybody has been very responsive to that. So I think that wherever we land, and there's reason for optimism for the fall as, as we look at our numbers, wherever we land, um, we all can look at that number and know that it's been a collective effort of, of a lot of individuals to help to get us there. Um, we're, we're hoping to be at least 1% up. We, we've worked toward that. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've seen some promising trends in terms of our, our enrollment numbers. Um, the things we know we're doing right, um, we are getting students to understand the urgency of acting sooner versus delaying. Mm -hmm. So so we're getting that right in terms of changing student mindsets. Um, when we look at certain um, uh, data points, we see exciting things. Um, fewer students not making academic progress. So that means that um, we have students who are being retained. And so we hope that will reflect in our continuing student number, um, those students coming back in the fall. Um, the same for satisfactory academic progress. It's a financial term that basically um, th there's criteria that students have to maintain to keep their financial aid. Well, we see more and more students being able to maintain that criteria. And we think a lot of that points back to other work that's going on, like our mandatory advising, our uh, mandatory new student orientation. But all of those data points, we hope we're going to see reflected in the numbers of our students that are returning, as well as uh, the number of students who are starting with us for the first time. Um, this week really has been a up and down week, and I know Dr. Goodson, you get these numbers daily and you get questions about it hourly. Um, these uh, these numbers uh, have have slightly down beginning of the week, um, flat and uh, trending slightly up. And so some interesting movement this week, but um, we're, every we're day's excited. a new day, right? Every day's a new day, <laughs> right. That's right? Exactly. Well, yeah. Jane, you mentioned new student orientation, <clears throat> which really we rolled out for the first time, that mandatory first time in. And so last summer, and it was really effective, and a lot of staff members, a lot of faculty members got involved. There were some pretty big changes in how that operates this year, um, just sort of in the idea of continuous improvement. And I, I've had a chance to do some of them myself, and it's just a whole lot of fun. So I'd put that plug in for anyone who might want to be involved and help with NSO. How were those changes made, and what do you think the impact has been in terms of how we've kind of restructured since last year? 
Absolutely. Um, to your point of just continuous improvement, um, one, you know, obviously we assess the students who are going through orientation, so we're looking for some feedback from them in terms of the experience they have, but then we also have so many important stakeholders involved in new student orientation around the college, and so what we've done there is have dialogue with those key stakeholders in the academic areas, for example, to get feedback from them on the experience and what we could do to improve it. So, so one of the things is that we felt that we had capacity for larger sessions. So, you know, the first thing that we did is we increased the number of students participating in a session. Um, we had such a fantastic turnout of volunteers the first year with new student orientation. Um, this year, uh, busier summer, sometimes you can just feel an institutional rhythm that, that just shifts a little bit. Um, the volunteerism had to work at getting those numbers and, and, and folks there a little bit more. And there was new training because of the changes that we made. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to make sure folks were, were adequately trained. But we increased the size of um, the sessions. But another thing we did that's very pathways oriented, very important is, is we started to gear those sessions towards academic schools. For students and so when we could look at the application of the student and see that they either uh, declared a specific major or expressed interest in an area that fit in a school then we tried to keep those sessions focused academic school focus and we really solicited feedback from faculty from those particular schools uh, to be involved in the orientation process uh, with the students. Um, another thing that we did is we um, added um, some more parent family sessions. Um, we found that um, our parents were accompanying students to new student orientation and there's a balance to be had there. I, I sidebar no judgment. I, I'm a helicopter parent <laughs> so no judgment at all. Um, but you know we wanted to give them something meaningful to, to do and um, learn some ways they could support their students but we also want the students to really develop that self-efficacy and have that that time away um, from from their parent or their guardian to um, start their own journey, educational journey. So that was an addition um, that we added. Um, and again, we're continuing to um, make those changes as we go. There's some behind the scenes things that are that are better. Our scheduling process. I think is better. Um, the training is better. We were doing those trainings in person and it's really hard to have enough of those sessions in person. So while we did that, we also developed some training resources and um, put them, you know, online. And I think that allowed people to train at their own pace. It's been exciting, hasn't it? It has been. Yeah, it has. Where do you want to see your group and student affairs be in the next five years? What's what's on your radar for the future? So just broadly speaking, you know, five years from now, you know, we'll be on the other side of Pathways implementation. We will be halfway through our next rendition of our strategic plan. And my assumption is that we're going to have successfully accomplished all of those initiatives and efforts currently associated with Pathways and our strategic plan. So on the other side of that, um, I want our reputation in this community, in this region, to be the reputation of um, the quality degree producer. Um, the greatest volume, the highest quality, uh, the best graduates. Um, we, we already enjoy a reputation like that. I, I guess I see us adding to that legend. I want us to be known for our, our service to students and the student experience and uh, for this to be um, the first real option for any student who's coming directly out of high school or for any student who is in the workforce who's looking to retrain, um, pursue a different career direction. I, I want us to be that first option for them. Jane, you've been with us before, right? Um, not on the not on the radio. But show. but on. It's fun, isn't but you, it? But you did the broadcast on on the channel with us, didn't you? Did you do that? I don't think I did. Maybe I think didn't. I was oh, there mean, when there was a broadcasting. You were you were just there one day. Okay. Yes. See, yes. I should know this, but I didn't go yes. back and look I, through my notes. I'm so. glad there's no camera, by the way. <laughs> 
Oh, you mean back when we were doing TV? Before, yes, yeah. when we were doing that's <laughs> in the TV <laughs> days. Uh, so we always ask. So all that to say, I, I was just going to see if you'd answer this question before to see if you had a different answer. But this is the first time, so I'm uh -huh. excited about it. So we ask all of our guests what we call the big question, which is if you could go back in time and give some advice to your 18-year-old college-bound self, what would that advice be? So when by the time I was 18, I was one of those 17-year-olds starting, so I was in college, so there's lots of advice I would give to myself at 18. <laughs> Don't go to that particular party. Um, <laughs> crimped hair is not going to come back. <laughs> Ripped jeans are. Uh, wear crop tops while you can, because you cannot do that in your 40s. Um, so you there's can, kind of a list maybe of that. Shouldn't. Maybe you should not. This, this is as funny as car talk. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, the, the more serious, you know, self, I, I really would just um, remind myself how much knowledge is, is power, which isn't my saying, but it's, it's kind of a known saying. And that really, um, what you know, the information you have access to, it, it's going to be a difference maker for you. I'm, I'm proudly a first generation um, college student from a low income family. And um, education is, is the great equalizer. And so what I would say is, you, you made these commitments. You didn't fully get why you were making these commitments there. There were some things that your parents put in you and expected, and you did it then just because that was the expectation. Um, but I would just remind myself then, like, keep moving forward with that. Don't let, um, you know, this door close make you not seek another door. Um, just keep pursuing information, keep pursuing education because it's going to be transformational. It's going to change your life in, in ways that you, you couldn't fathom. Well, you've been listening to the Big Blue Podcast, and our guest today has been Dr. Jan Clayton, Senior Student Affairs Officer. Thanks for coming in. It's been great. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah. And you can fun. listen every week uh, to the Big Blue Podcast and the week at TCC and also on the Creativity Channel on YouTube. Dr. Goodson, thank you. I've had a great time. And Thanks. we'll see you all next time. Thanks for listening.